Everybody heard that, right? <laughs> yeah. Recording in progress. Okay, so now we're going to start the <laughs> official thing. Oh, I like seeing everybody better, but I think this 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 view is uh, better for the recording. So um, I'm going to do a quick introduction of me and Casey and Charlie, but really quick because we want them to tell more of, about themselves and their stories, and I'll try to keep it uh, brief. And thanks to everybody who's here. Um, it's awesome to have people watching this. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting, interesting to learn a lot of stuff from Casey and Charlie. Um, so I'm Jeff and I have the Instagram account Elliot Smith Discography and I have a website about Elliot Smith um, Discography, like all the different pressings of records and stuff. Um, real briefly, I first knew who Elliot Smith was in 1995. Saw him play opening for Mary Lou Lord and saw him play a bunch after that. Um, but I wasn't that involved in the Elliott Smith community or whatever back then. I like would give Charlie updates on set lists from LA shows or I recorded some shows or you know any little tidbits I had to add to Sweet Adeline was kind of my thing, but not, not that much. I didn't have my own website. I didn't know Elliot. I, I talked to him once for 30 seconds at Largo and you know, mostly just a fan until you know last few years I just I wanted there to be a discography like that online for myself more than anything and I made one and made the Instagram and now I know a lot more people that are Elliot Smith fans than I used to so that's my story and I met Charlie in person in 2001 at a show and we hung out a couple times at shows and um, so Charlie is the one who started sweetadeline.net in 1998 um, I think a lot of people watching this know Charlie, know who he is, and I don't really want to get into your story because we'll get into your story um, as we go. So that's Charlie. And then Casey, I Everyone. very <laughs> vaguely knew who Casey was. Um, I did like an Instagram thing. Um, Charlie is the <laughs> hero. Of, <laughs> yeah, as it, on everything I posted about this, everybody just had to say how great Charlie was, so. And Charlie just says how great Casey is. So, um, uh, Casey had an earlier Elliot Smith website. Charlie told me the other day it was not the first. Somebody else says they had the first one. I have to jump in already. <laughs> there, there is like a, a in between about that, and that's only based off the research I did for before this before this whole uh, discussion. So which is part of maybe that will come up between Casey and I, I guess at a certain point, but uh, yeah, there, it's possible that, or there's there, there's this weird uh, in between, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> so um, I didn't really, I, I may have looked at Casey's website back in the day and uh, you know, before Sweet Adeline existed, like it's so long ago and I, I, I don't know, I, I just don't remember too specifically or, how much I did. Um, so I, I started hearing Casey's name more just recently because Kill Rock Stars just put out the 25th anniversary uh, pressing of the um, self titled album and it had Casey's recording of the Umber Penumbra show um, on there. So I was reading, oh, this person Casey recorded this. And then I ended up talking to Casey and Charlie kind of separately on an Instagram thing a few months ago. And Charlie told more of the story about Casey and as Charlie as you were talking about Casey on that Instagram thing I was like oh yeah like everywhere on Sweet Adeline there's like thanks to Casey for this set list thanks to Casey and I was like kind of putting two two and two together but until you told me and the people that were watching on Instagram more of Casey's story I didn't know that much of Casey's story so that's where we want to start because Casey was a fan and an acquaintance or friend, I believe, of Elliot before you knew who he was, before I knew who he was. So he was like the earliest fan here. So um, Casey, do you want to yeah. kind of tell us like the beginning of knowing Elliot's music and knowing Elliot personally? Like, did you live in Portland? What, you know, what was going on in your life and how did the world of Elliot like enter your life and start Start where you want to start, I guess. Yeah, sure. Wait, were you saying I'm the oldest Elliot fan here? I probably uh, yeah, <laughs> the uh, longest, <laughs> the longest. No, Jeff wins that uh, that that honor. I think yeah. the longest is also the yeah. oldest. Yeah, I think you told me last time on Instagram you're a tiny bit older <laughs> than I am. But. 
but yeah, I mean, yeah, literally, I I was just thinking when this when the Umber Penumbra show, I'll just jump ahead, came to be, that was like, yeah, I'm almost I'm just a little over fifty now, and that was about twenty five. That was like half of my life ago. So it's it's been kind of a, a long time since I engaged with Elliot and his content, his music, and his life on a, on a serious basis. But um, yeah, I was in Portland. Uh, because I went to school there around 1990, I, I transferred over to Reed College and um, went to school there for a while and um, and then eventually moved. And I just really liked Portland. Um, and I had played a little bit of music, just was just getting into like acoustic guitar and stuff. Um, in my college, like my pre college years, played a lot of acoustic, Grateful Dead stuff. And um, it's funny going from the Grateful Dead to Elliot Smith, but <laughs> it, did, it did happen. Like, um, I got opened up, turned out to a ton of alternative uh, indie stuff, like in my college years from 90 to 92. And and then ended up just staying in Portland because the scene was so vibrant and had some really good friends. And um, the guys I was living with, we were all just good friends. Went to college with two of them and we were trying to start a band and just trying to make it in the Portland scene, as a lot of people were at the time. I played guitar and bass, and um, my friend and his brother, the one friend, probably his name's Eric, he's actually the guy that booked the Elliott Show. Um, he was a aspiring singer, songwriter, and I think in 93, or late 93, uh, ended up just in the same circles as Elliott. I had not even heard of Elliott. This was pre-Roman Candle. Um, so I think was Roman Candle was 94, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, so my friend Eric, who's also mentioned on there, his name's Eric Brugman, good friend I met in college back in the day, um, and then tried to start a band with, and he was trying to do his own thing. He, he was, um, he, he reminded me of the story where he met Elliot Smith um, at these small singer-songwriter um, like coffee shop shows that they were doing as fundraisers for a local uh, homeless shelter called outside in in Portland and um, somehow they had tapped Elliot for it to help raise money to the doing these acoustic shows and my friend Eric was trying to do some stuff with them as well and, and just was blown away by Elliot and um, we had this connection to this coffee shop at Umber Penumbra um, and, Elliot and Eric had the idea to start booking shows there it's a really small coffee shop it's literally only like you know it's like a shoebox kind of boxcar shaped place, it's really narrow, but really long. It had like a, a little stage in the back with like curtains for like theatrical stuff uh, or open mics. But it was uh, Eric that finally, that booked that first Elliot show. Um, and I think at the time I was also on the side trying to just dabbling a lot of four track recording and had this sort of uh, pipe dream of, of trying to do a small record label. Um, but I wasn't sure, I think it was, yeah. And, and I believe Elliot's album had just been released like right before we, we booked Elliot, like a couple of months before Roman Candle had, been, had just come out. So I was pretty familiar with it. And was just driving around town all the time or walking around, listening to it on Walkman. Cause it was, it was, an, it was a cassette only release. It was on uh, Cavity Search Records. It only came out on cassette. I mean, a lot of stuff was still on cassette. Well, I think there was CD. There was no vinyl, but there was, I believe there was CD. Well, there was later, maybe on a reach, but literally like Cavity Search, they, when they were doing their, when they were producing and releasing, it was a, it was like a cassette only um, label. They only did stuff on cassette. Um, or, or, well, I know Elliot's only came on cassette, but uh, I'm not sure at what point it was, Released on CD. I've never even, I never bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw it. I mean, Charlie, was it on CD? I don't remember. Yeah, back oh, it eventually came, came out on CD, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure um, when it was released. You know, I, I came in later, so Dude, you were there. Just, you were ground yeah. zero for, for, for yeah, it was for only the area. Just like locally in Portland, I mean, or, you know, surrounding areas, but. But I mean, that, that wasn't odd or anything for the time, like lo-fi, cassette releases, four track. I mean, it made a lot of sense. So Umber Penumbra was the first time you saw him play or you had seen him at a show before that? No, I had never seen him play. In fact, I don't think he, I don't even know. He may have had a couple small shows, but he really hadn't been booking anything yet. 
-hmm. he didn't really have many public appearances before um, from Candle. I think Charlie had you Brown. seen him as in Heat Miser, Casey? Yeah, so I had seen him in Heat Miser, and that, but I didn't really. Yeah, I think I had once or twice um, at this place called La Luna. But as you know, I was like totally different band, but an amazing band, especially when you know later when he started playing focusing in on more of his melodic stuff. Um, and, you know, the last album was like pretty much an Elliott album. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike City Sons. A lot of his amazing tracks on there. But um, probably only, yeah, I think I only saw Heat Miser once before that. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, just doing that show, it was just a, a, just all kind of serendipitously came together. My friend Eric booking it. Elliot and then um, I had the idea to like let's just start recording stuff for this label I was doing because this was going to be an ongoing thing where we would have uh, local singer songwriters come in and perform on like a monthly basis or and we would book a couple people at a time so the, the night Elliot was booked there was another guy who was like a local um, singer songwriter uh, done a, who did a ton of like country stuff country western he was an older dude his name was lucky the six string outlaw he was a famous street musician in portland who we met on the street because we were playing music a lot on the street here and there so we just we ended up booking him now he's an older dude he's always had like some western wear and it's got his cowboy hat and just had this awesome energy and he'd walk around with like a shopping cart and his guitar in it and some other stuff and yeah he would just bang out these songs um but anyway, Lucky played and uh, Elliot played and I'm not sure if there's someone named Sarah Short, um, but we still have the original compilation somewhere. Did you ever get that, Charlie? Yeah, I, I never know. got it, no. You never got it, okay. No. That, really? that too was only, <laughs> so that was a cassette release. Maybe I'm confusing, but that was a cassette only release too. The li live at Umber Penumbra, that, that one? Live at Umber Penumbra. Yeah, I don't have that either, I'd like, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> How, how many uh, cassettes did you release, Casey? Do you remember? Uh, it wasn't more than like a hundred. I mean, it was a huge operation just to like to take my four track stuff into a studio <laughs> and then um, master it, and then work with like an independent like reproduction house to do a cassette release. It was probably a hundred, um, and then like doing artwork, like print. I think I actually had it printed officially, but I normally would have done it like I was at like Kinko's. <laughs> <laughs> just do something really DIY for the label art and only sold at the venue was that, was uh, that I don't that even true? recall you know I think we I tried to I brought some to some local record shops like Music Millennium um, I don't think we sold many it was pretty much given we gave you know quite a few to the artists themselves um, but it was it was kind of a, it was a very cool thing at the time and uh, but the, the funny thing about it is the recording itself um, didn't it sounded good as you, you know you could hear it you guys have heard what they released on KR on, on Kill Rock Stars but the original recording that I released actually had a problem with the speed on the, the tape speed it was slightly slow so it's it's like almost a half second slow or or a quarter second so like Elliot's voice is a lot deeper on it. Um, and it's something I didn't really pick up on, and but Elliot heard it, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you might want to adjust that." It seems really awesome. <laughs> uh, but we never did. But they kind of got, they kind of got it right. Um, uh, who's the guy? Jackpot. I'm trying to remember. Larry. Larry. Larry yeah, Larry. Yeah. So Larry was able to to adjust that by like just listening to to. Um, the way Elliot tuned his tuned his guitar and you know just pitch shifted it up for the right for the right tuning and the right speed. So yeah, it sounds it sounds. I mean, re remarkably, my recording sounded pretty similar. I thought because I listened to it so much over the years. You know, obviously, what 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 uh, what Larry did was pretty amazing. And um, but yeah, I mean, that's sort of the story of how it was recorded. And then from there, I mean. Elliot just started doing a lot of stuff. So, and I, I was just checking with my my friend Eric. He did remind me that Elliot did play another show at Umbra, probably later that um, that year, early '95, and it was actually much much bigger. I mean, when I did the recording, yeah, it was literally like 20 people. I was sitting on the floor, 
uh, with like a little four track, my, my main four track that I would do all my stuff on. Um, and then a little mixing board and that was it. I mean, I was like one foot from like Elliot's shoes. It was mm-hmm. bizarre. Um, and there was only, yeah, you could hear like people grinding coffee in the background. <laughs> it's pretty intimate as, as it still is. You can hear it. Um, but yeah, so he did play there again, I think uh, like another half year later. And uh, I think a lot of Elliot's friends and family showed up. Eric told me and brought some small gifts because Elliot was going to go on one of his first small tours, um, probably for probably for Roman Candle. Yeah, because that was, yeah. Awesome. I know that Char- Charlie and I, um, I know Charlie really wants to get into the, uh, the experience oh <laughs> of making, no, of like the experience of being a fan at that time in terms of making a website and especially maybe for younger people. I think younger people know how the internet was different back then, but I don't maybe don't grasp it yeah. as, as well as we do that. Like, um, you know, the websites that started by fans like that at that time were like essential. Other than that, you just had like magazine and newspaper articles and stuff because there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, there was no Spotify or Bandcamp or YouTube to hear like you, you know, if you wanted information up to date on on an artist, it, it was websites and those were just kind of a brand new thing and stuff and just how you, I know Charlie knows the technical stuff more, but he, Charlie's talked to me about how like what he could do on a website back then was so much <laughs> more challenging obviously than today so um how long after you recorded that show and started listening to his music when did what was like sort of the beginning of hey i'm going to make a website if that's what you want to get into next i, I think that sounds interesting yeah, I think that, yeah it was definitely a couple years after um and i had moved to new york city i think in 95 but it kind of just it sort of dovetailed into my interest in um getting into website development, web design. I had played around with computers a lot as a kid. My dad got me like an Apple II Plus and was, was doing like bulletin boards and trading games. And so all this sort of stuff kind of culminated because Elliot was, was my inspiration to do my first website and to learn like, I sort of dabbled in Photoshop. And uh, I mean, to build a website, it was pretty, it was pretty complicated. I like, was learning HTML, not being a programmer and still not being one. Trying to figure that out. Um, but oddly, he was, you know, Elliot was the inspiration to, to get into that and also to, um, to kind of get a job in that, in that field. You know, that was my, my sort of testing, my um, proving ground was to build this Elliot site. But before, it was, before I was actually making a site in HTML, I was using this uh, community driven sort of web, WYSIWYG web builder uh, that Charlie knows, everybody, a lot of people know that tripod site. It was a community bulletin board site that you could, it gave you free hosting. Uh, in exchange, they would just put tons of banner ads all over your stuff, all over your pages. <laughs> but yeah, that was the first site, yeah. But that was the first Elliot site. But it wasn't called Elliot, it was called like Skylash, which is sort of the name, been the name for my um, creative pursuits over the last 25 years. And it was the name for the label that this, uh, the Umber Show came out on Skylash, Skylash Records. So what was the what was the full URL? Do you remember it anymore? <laughs> like <laughs> skylash dot tripod dot slash. Yeah, it was like till, it was like the tilde slash. Yeah, sky. yeah. Oh, just all <laughs> members dot tripod dot com slash tilde <laughs> skylash. And I mean, it's it's still there. You can see it in those. Um, uh, Charlie sent me a link to it. Yeah, yeah. I went to archive dot org and. Uh, yeah, the easiest is way is, is, is to maybe backtrack through uh, uh, elliotsmith.com. Um, you could kind of backtrack a little bit um, using that URL for archive.org. And um, that'll help you, you know, kind of jump to different versions, actually, of, of Casey's sites. And, um, you know, it helped a lot the last couple of days researching <laughs> and remembering you know, things that, that Casey did over the years. So. 
It, what, what do you remember? You said there was a, there was a mailing list. So actually, that was actually the first thing I did. I remember. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the Yahoo. List I have so it. many questions. So okay. Uh, you know, I don't I don't even know where to start. But uh, you know, <laughs> I I had talked to Jeff about doing things chrono chronologically. I can't say it right, but um, <laughs> and so I do have like questions in that way. But you know, uh. Well, you can do it. You can do it chronologically. That might be better. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you don't mind, is that okay, no. Jeff? Too. Yeah, you take over. You have way more. Uh, you have way more good questions to ask. I'm sure than I do. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Um, first, I'll do a small little intro and first say hi to everybody that's on. I see a lot of old friends, uh, people I've hung out with, uh, new friends that I've got to meet within days and, um, and you know and, and maybe I, I'm not seeing everybody's name here um, uh, but anyways I want to say hi to everybody and that, and also uh, say thank you to Casey because uh, I, we kind of talked before through Jeff <laughs> uh, and I gave a lot of praise to Casey he's definitely my mentor and the pr person I really um, was inspired by to to make my site and future sites, you know, outside the Elliot Smith realm, and uh, and and also continue to to do it. So, Casey, I give you so much props, and I'm so thankful for you. And um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So, uh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> um, wow. Generally speaking, I just kind of uh, you know. I, kind of wanted to get a little bit of background about you because some of it you covered already a little bit um like one was just kind of like where are you from are you were you originally from Oregon or is that somewhere you you went to eventually yeah so I went there um to go to, to read college uh in 90 spring of 1990 but previous I was, I was I'm, I'm from the east coast originally born and uh, raised no raised a little bit in Scranton, Pennsylvania, hometown of our new president, or small time, <laughs> for a small period he was living there. But yeah, I'm from Scranton, my parents are from there. But we eventually moved to the West Coast in the 70s and then uh, back to the East Coast. And But I always had a thing for the West Coast. So I went to USC for a year, but it really didn't click for me. Uh, I was in like 89, 90, and then I transferred up to Portland at, at Reed College and just stayed there um, through about 90, 95, you know through those initial Elliot years. And then I moved uh, a bunch of my friends. I got Eric I was talking about. He, we all kind of moved to New York, New York was, City. Uh, I mean, did you and have like brothers and sisters, like anybody that inspired you uh, in, in different ways, like media wise or like music? You know, some people have brothers and sisters who kind of like pass on music yes. to them and stuff like that. Uh, well, I was the oldest. I'm the oldest boy. I was the oldest oh. son. My <laughs> sister, uh, my sister Meredith, she's about a year and a half younger. And then I've got two younger brothers who are tw identical twins that came came quite a bit later. I had the same parents, but they they came when I was like two, uh, like 16 years in in high school. So they're like uh, yeah. 17 years younger. Uh, it's crazy, and they love Elliot thanks to me. My sister loves Elliot. <laughs> But I mean, everyone awesome. likes Elliot. Even my parents like Elliot. They they met Elliot personally in Austra at an Aust show in Sydney, Australia. Oddly enough. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was kind of. I guess they went and like went said said hi to. He was just hanging out near the bar, waiting to go, waiting for the opening act to finish. And he went. Up, and my dad went over and like tapped him on the shoulder and said, "Hey, how you doing? Um, we know we're Casey's parents." And Elliot, I was just, at that point, I heard that story. I was like, oh man, Elliot must think I'm a complete stalker. So, I mean, part of the whole passion for Elliot, I felt like I was a bit of a super fan and I was always trying to track him down. We were never like super good friends, but we were acquaintances after the Umber Penumbra thing. Um, and, and, you know, he went to New York before I did. So, oddly, I ended up going to New York for different reasons, but. But I, I did, did ended up having a rapport. I had his phone number, and I would just call him to like try and get into shows, and or to like find out <laughs> what he was playing. Um, I think there was an email that email address. But I felt very privileged, and I would share that information on my website with people as as I could. Um, right. 
I did see uh, one one of the pages did show like Elliot contacting you about a show and uh, kind of oh, telling like, you about it. It was like <laughs> it was a cut and paste of the email, right? Right, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. And so, so I, yeah, I was curious, like how uh, how much uh, you know, kind of later on in the discussion, like how, how uh, you know, obviously you you met Elliot the first night um, at yeah. that that show. And and you had actually a great or a, a story, a cool story about the you know the time right before I think he got on stage to play that you guys went to to get something to drink. I was wondering if you could tell that story again. Um, yeah, yeah. But I just one thing back on your original question about in, early inspirations from family. Yeah, I mean my parents were were into a lot. They weren't musical or anything, but they turned me on to like Simon and Garfunkel and the Beatles and. They, I got my mom had a classical guitar that I ended up inheriting and they got me guitar lessons. So, um, and they also were the ones, like I was saying, that got me into computers. So computers and music all came together with Elliot and, in a way. It was pretty interesting. But um, yeah, so thank, I thank them a lot for that. And, but and can I, I ask you really quick in high school, like where were you like feeling? Like where were you going? uh life-wise you know like where were your interests when you were considering the going to read college I mean were you was it going for uh, music or for computers or media or or or, or just the music scene <laughs> itself uh, well I think originally no I mean growing up in Connecticut I was kind of had a conservative outlook on what you should do after college like go into business um, and you know, I grew up a bit on the, on the West Coast. So I wanted to go back to that sort of West Coast California life. Um, somehow the stock market was kind of attractive for some reason. Uh, and, but I went to USC. It was not for music, but it was more for business. But then it was these people I met that were highly influential, like this guy, Eric, and um, all these other these misfits who were there for the film program at um, the University of Southern California. It was a really good film program. Yeah. So it was through them, they kind of like redirected me to what I was really into, which was creativity and music. And um, eventually I got into anthropology up at, up at Reed, but, but it was because of them that I eventually just switched course and focused on more soulful stuff. Um, and again, Grateful Dead, that, that really influenced me in, in playing music. Um, that was my pre Elliot stuff. But yeah, so what was your question <laughs> back well, in, um, so i just uh, so i i see it kind of like you know then you went to read you kind of transitioned yeah. right uh you were into music and then uh uh and then kind of got into the portland scene um yeah um and generally uh, i mean it's, this is kind of leading up to to your hanging out with elliot that same night you recorded him right but, uh i was just kind of curious uh also was like uh you know how 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 did you feel about the scene at that time because you know obviously you saw heat miser i don't i don't know if you had it if the grateful dead did influence you in a certain way of, of what music yeah. you did in portland and then how you kind of became a part of the scene well yeah like, the grateful dead yeah i mean at that point when i went when i was headed up toward portland um the grateful dead were sort of in the back seat in my rear view mirror and I was going definitely more toward alternative music. And I think I had just gone through a big REM phase and uh, just re reconnecting with the greats like the Smiths and um, God, other stuff. But the thing is like, yeah, it, I mean, before Elliot, um, there was just such a huge renaissance of music going on in Portland at the time from like, you know, Nirvana came out in like 90 or something. and just hanging out at the hanging out in the pool halls and they were just like blasting like out songs from bleach and, and that stuff just really kind of blew, blew my mind i wasn't into like creating but but that inspired me a lot and and so many people in portland at the time were trying to make it in the music scene and there was people were handing out record record deals left and right um did you see mind. like um like hazel and the spinning yeah, yeah. and so team trash I, I loved i loved so many bands I'm like looking back at it now i'm like man i really wish i lived even at the time i was like so many bands from that scene were some of my favorite bands and i saw all of them down here in la but you know yeah uh no it was a very privileged time to be there i mean that oh, like yeah. we talked about 
team drash. I love uh, team drash. They played. They would play at our played at our at Reed College once or twice. Um, that girl Jody Bliley, she went to Reed. And yeah, the Spinanes, there was that, uh, I forget, it was like a Portland independent music fest that started happening every year. And they'd play outside under like the steel bridge. And um, yeah, it was just a really, a really tight knit scene. Um, it was very different than I think what was going on in Seattle. There's a lot of rivalry. Yeah. Um, lot. Did you feel yeah, like so that you were fitting and, in with like that? Pete Krebs and, and, and the rest of the guys that were close to Elliot, like eventually Quasi or? motor goat and stuff like that as well did i fit in with them what or did you did you hang out with them and oh i didn't i didn't i hung out with if anything it was more the people in elliot's like inner circle his outers his little circle pete krebs and sean krogan were the guys that because i recorded them on umbra as well but i would see them more often um around town and stuff uh nice. elliot so i would see elliot around he was always kind of he was always a bit shy a little reclusive and um He's either with his girlfriend, Joanna. They both had like the green dyed hair. I thought it was like this one time I saw them walking down the street and they, they had this matching like bright mint green hair. It was really <laughs> cool. Um, you remember that you'd see pictures of Elliot with dyed hair. Yeah. From, yeah. Um, it, so uh, kind of so going back to, what, can you tell us a little bit about that story about kind of hanging out with him? You know, oh, yeah. I just that, I thought it was a cute little not story. much of a story, but I mean, yeah. it was just an experience. It was really my first experience one-on-one -on -one with Elliot. And it was just a little, a little chit-chat walk to the corner store um, in between him playing a little set at Umber Penumbra. Well, I think I was playing, I was just strumming on a guitar backstage and I was okay at playing guitar. And he heard me, he's like, hey man, you should play. I was like, oh yeah, maybe. He's like, no, you should really play. He's like, cause he was, he's like, you should play tonight. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then he's like, hey man, do you, know, do you know if there's a store? I want to get some beer before we play for, for my friends. And so, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I know a little place. So we walked and um, yeah, we just walked to this little corner store. And I remember Sierra Nevada was like a really special beer at the time. And I know Elliot became really uh, famous for drinking that a lot on stage way before crap. <laughs> It was way before craft beer was cool. Um, but that was an expensive beer. I didn't have a ton of money at the time, but I remember Elliot's like, he bought like, a, he bought like two six packs of, of uh, Sierra Pale and offered me one. And I just was so honored to drink a beer with Elliot as we were walking back. Um, he just was a really gentle, sweet guy. And, you know, he really would, uh, but it was, he was slightly intimidating in that sense that he was so vulnerable. You just, you almost wanted to keep your distance slightly. Um, but I know if I had pushed him ever to like get closer to him in a friendship, it, we probably could have done it, but I, I never did. Um, he's, it's cause thing, things just spark, it snowballed for him. He just got more and more busy and caught up in his, in his musical career. Right. But he was always there. You know, I wouldn't talk to him for a long time. And someone in New York, I would reach out to him and, and when I knew he had a show coming up and I'd try and they were trying to make a way to connect with him or. Or even like at a show in New York afterwards, he didn't know I was there. And I just, they, you know, they kind of hung out backstage and stuff, but he always would let me come down and say hi. And like, you know, he'd give him, give me a beer from his, from his cooler. Or, but it was <laughs> only just a few words here. And there. I mean, it's just a really gentle, sweet little conversation. So many people wanted to talk to him. So many people, he, it was in demand. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I kind of, kind of transitioning back to uh, basically your New York years. Um, uh, you, you left Portland and went to New York, um, you know, for, for when I kind of got into, into Elliot and, and kind of knowing about you and, 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 and learning about you from that point. Uh, I think you were working at MTV, Viacom, Nickelodeon kind of uh, circle. Um, just how did you transition to that? Because I, uh, uh, from from Reed, because uh, I figured what you were learning there at Viacom, you were probably going to use to build what you built uh, at Skylash, or you know what would become Elliot.com. Yeah. Um, yeah, that just got that just sort of happened. Um, 
by chance. I mean, I luckily I had a connection to to some people there at Viacom, not right, MTV Networks, and I was able to get a job there just as a temp, just like an in-house temp. I would fill in, I would fill in for people's like assistants who, who would call in sick, and I ended up just in all these different roles um, right off the bat. I had a job like working on the um, Beavis and Butthead movie for like a couple days. <laughs> I didn't fit in there. I like misplaced some paperwork and they fired, let me go. And then I was working for, <laughs> literally working for Kurt Loader, if you guys remember that dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I was yeah. like taking his call, taking his phone calls. But anyway, what this really allowed me, I, would, I had, we had, they had like high speed broadband internet at this office and like, there was a lot of um, perks. And there was a lot of free time to dabble on the internet and start messing around. And, and then I ended up just started staying later and building this site. But like, but I think the one thing I failed to mention was that having this recording in my back pocket was something that I felt very privileged, and you know, I just felt like I needed to share it with people. Um, so I started offering it to people, and I would like offer it to them through mail, you know, mail it out to them and such, uh, mail order. And I, I sent out quite a few copies, and then I guess people started, you know, started digitizing it over the years. There was another, another alley. I was living in uh, with my parents in, Port, in uh, Princeton before I actually moved into the city for a little while, but I was working at MTV Networks and I recorded Elliot at the Terrace Club in Princeton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Another, I don't know if you've ever heard that, but yeah, it was a pretty, uh, it was not my four tracks. That recording you never heard out it? there. Yeah, that recording's out there. Like, I have that one. Yeah. That doesn't jump out for me. <laughs> yeah, some of the, so some of the LA, some of the LA recordings are my recordings it's kind of cool when your recording is the recording yeah. that's out there but yeah yeah i have that princeton one in my yeah, so, uh, cds so the mailing so we were kind of going back to to like the intro the early days of the of the internet for probably a lot of us on the on the public side of things um um and, you know, I see a couple of friends who, again, probably were around that, during that time. Um, the ones, the things that I found early on was a mailing list. Or I think there was a couple. One I know for sure was Yahoo. And that was maybe the last one. There might have been like kind of a GeoCities one, maybe. I, I remember like Luke Wood being on that on that list. And then that kind of crashing because of drama <laughs> some early internet drama um and uh and then also uh usenet news groups um that were kind of like bulletin boards and stuff like that um so were you on those pretty early on and uh, uh kind of getting an idea of the fandom that was out there that was more uh you know kind of statewide worldwide all that that kind of thing i, I don't think so it's kind of in my own <laughs> little elliot <laughs> cubby hole um definitely was not on usenet but i think there okay. was like you said there was a couple other uh fan sites that might have been co you know in existence right around when i had mine um because there was someone's got a girl named april april do you remember that fan site no oh yes uh -huh. I, I actually wrote down the the full name of it it is uh uh april's elliot smith and other northwest indie bliss <laughs> yeah, the yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you have a year on the on its existence i don't you know so if we were to do timelines uh at, at this point yeah. there there at the beginning of our discussion um, when i was researching i always had thought that there was uh, nathan franklin uh, from he was from Texas, uh, he had a, a a site. Yes, and originally, yeah, it was yeah. Elliot. To, to me, it was originally Elliot Smith, but I believe he covered Heat Miser actually as well. So, but you there was a certain point on your website that you said, "Hey, there's a new site by Nathan." <laughs> so there, I think there was a little there's a little weird confusion about that, but. Um, anyways, uh, when I came online um, as a fan, uh, your site, April's site, and Nathan's site e existed along with the mailing lists. Um, 
and um and uh you know obviously i i gravitated to your site because it was actually being updated on a regular basis at that point and um and so so yeah so uh, uh, so since you were kind of in your own, as you described it, your own, your own, your own world, uh, and you were kind of having an idea of what you wanted to do, I was just curious. Like, aside from having an in with the cassette or uh, with the show, what were, what was really your motivation to start a page about Elliot? Well, like I was saying before, I mean, it was also a way to trying to hone my skills and try and further my my job path and like career path I was still like a just a temp a temp worker I was trying to get into into the dot-com business so I was trying to be a website designer so this was definitely my main way to as a portfolio piece really to showcase what I could do and also just to learn um but it, it all right. just kind of worked I mean I was in the same company in the same network that was eventually discovering Elliot and Elliot was going to go on to play a, a show at like MTV live where they're doing that daily live show he played in Times Square the but Carson was, Daly the, the Carson Daly the, yeah he, yeah yeah and, yeah and it all just worked out for me you know I just worked at this you know I ended up um, being able to connect with to use the sort of credentials of working in MTV even though I wasn't like an official and an executive there, but I, I, I was able to talk to some, some, you know, get connections with Elliot's labels, find out who's playing and ended up having a conversation with uh, his manager at one point. But I mean, at that point I had the website. So there was some, there was some sort of credibility. I had the you know, right. and when I started that, I did think they were, there was some mon potentially a monetary gain or that we would collaborate or they would bring me closer to Elliot. But but it never, it really never did because they went to buy, you know, started their own site, ElliotSmith.net, right? Right. And then you, yeah. yeah. Well, they, did you, did you start that one first or did they? <laughs> no, in, uh, funny enough, so that, okay, so, uh, and this is kind of what's going to be a question for later. Uh, yeah. You know, there was your site, of course. And then in uh, XO, there's, uh, if I remember right, I, I want I didn't have time to go like look for my CD, but uh, they did advertise I think alphabet uh, dash town dot com, which was uh, yeah. they would have they it did exist. It had a video um, of Elliot in the studio, uh, and you can find it um, on YouTube. It's a little really really grainy. It's really old school video. Um, but uh, that existed, but disappeared. Um, and what my question later on was going to be for concerning that is, did uh, since you, it sounds like you did probably talk to Margaret Middleman at M3 or talk to, to people at DreamWorks, um, um, were you ever approached to, to do the official site for, for Elliot or? that come up in any kind of discussion, um, especially knowing him? Uh, sadly, it never came to fruition, not even mm. close, which was always surprising. And I think, right. I think, you know, they just were shying away from the internet at the time or Elliot wasn't pushing it or, you know, they, you know, like uh, uh, Kill Rockstars didn't have much of an Elliot Smith presence online. Um, <laughs> they, they actually, uh, uh, because you had mentioned that in our last uh, the, yeah. the discussion you had with Jeff, and funny enough, it, it was like the original Kill Rock Stars website uh, had like a GeoCities address <laughs> that was yeah. being managed by somebody else. <laughs> so they're all like that. Yeah. I have like uh, I have catalogs from the '90s from Kill Rock Stars, Slumberland, Matador, all those record labels, and they're. There are URLs for all those in like 1995. They're all like just, just <laughs> crazy, to, crazy to, to see them. I still have all those uh, old catalogs and stuff. But Charlie, that Alphabet Town, that was different than the person that has that Alphabet Town now, right? That's not correct. That person just took that URL that, now to make that one. The Alphabet Town was considered the, the official, first right? official site. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, 
I don't remember her name at, at this moment, uh, but I did find out a, a, at one point uh, who originally did that site. But, but I, I agree with Casey, like uh, I think the labels were, I mean, Cavity Search was there with trying to promote their, their artists. Um, but I agree with Casey again, uh, that, you know, like they had the site and they kind of dropped the site, you know, they didn't really put much more into it. And I'm not really sure why, especially at the time that, you know, Casey had his site um, and uh, my site was, came online about July and uh, uh, XO came out in August. So, you know, I'm surprised that, that, that they didn't uh, approach Casey about a site, especially for as much content as he had. And also um, compared to the other two sites that, that were kind of out there, Casey was totally about the news, totally about updating, totally about audio and video were just like very important to the, to the page. And um, even, even with uh, <laughs> how limited it was, at the time of when, when it came to bandwidth and stuff, that stuff was there, you know, that, that, that's what was very uh, uh, amazing, uh, especially at that time to see and to, to go through, you know, and, and, and experience because there was things that you would, like there was clips from uh, uh, Lucky Three and uh, XO stuff. And um, at a certain point, you know, Casey had uh, some downloads of XO to preview before the album came out. So, um, so yeah, I'm very surprised that that they did not approach Casey. Do you think uh, that had to do with time. like Elliot not really caring about no. it? Or I mean, it's still it's still pretty I, early. Now it doesn't. Now it looks kind of silly to think that like the internet is you know isn't that big of a deal to have a presence but it was still sort of early in the internet i guess labels bands artists they were just kind of hit and miss on figuring out like whether it was something to really pursue and take time to do i guess right what you know it wasn't worth investing in because everybody everybody was doing old school advertising and media you know like they were still doing magazines they were still doing ads they were you know they were still doing all those things. The internet at that time was pretty new. So um, so they weren't gonna invest into it because they didn't know what it would what it would come from. And, you know, I, I think Casey and, and many other, um, you know, sites that inspired me. Um, another site that, that inspired me was uh, murmurs.com by Ethan Capelin. Um, and even, even uh, Kevin Smith uh, Jay and, uh, from Jay and Silent Bob, uh, he, his webmaster did an amazing job of, of, of uh, building a website to promote Kevin's stuff. And um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, like what Casey said is that no one really understood what a difference this was gonna, mm -hmm. the internet was gonna make at the time. And uh, I mean, obviously we know now <laughs> how, how, how big it is and how important it is so but uh uh kind of let's see where um uh, oh, yeah. go ahead, oh, go ahead. No, okay. no i was just gonna had a thought that elliot probably didn't really need the extra promotion I mean, he was so he was so um ready to take over the world without the internet just local, right. at least in the West, then domestically. But yeah. it was so cool to see fan, local fan sites coming up here and there. But yeah, they just dropped the ball on the internet. I think Elliot didn't know the potential and using it to connect with fans. They No one told him. I mean, I don't know. I honestly, I was How trying to think about that Lucky Three, like that guy, Jim Cohen. I'm wondering where, because I remember digitizing that. Like, when I was working, at, I was actually had a job at Nickelodeon inside. That was my first, like, uh, I was a interactive producer. So then I had a lot of connection to, to equipment and broadband and I could work, 20, like work in this office 24 seven. So that's when I started uploading <laughs> a lot of that multimedia stuff. 
which to me was what I was really into was, was putting Elliot's, you know, audio and video content up right. and then or, message, no, making little, yeah, yeah. There was no YouTube, like, you know, no, it's just, no it's YouTube. like there was that the beginning of the internet until like 2000 and I think YouTube started in 2007 and you know, like yeah. it was that time when you had to have the website and put it on the site. There wasn't like a sharing site. There was no social media. It was like, I knew every day to go to like Sweet Adeline to see if there was news. I didn't check, uh, you know, social media cause we didn't have it. And so, yeah, it's like having that on your site now, like, oh, I have a website where I have this Elliot Smith video. People will be like, who cares? Like, it's all right there on YouTube, <laughs> right? Like that was unique, that was unique that you had you had something different that maybe nobody else had up there. Oh, he, yeah, it was way ahead of a lot of sites that I, I saw, you know, like, I mean, there's, there's things that I, I would have never saw at the time, you know, if it wasn't for Casey being able to do this kind of thing. Um, I saw. Did, you, did you see Lucky 3 on my site for the first time? I, I, I don't know if you posted the whole thing i know yeah, I that the whole yeah. Thing. Yeah. then then definitely yes because <laughs> it, it was it was released later on video but i i had seen it before on your site then um i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna read it i'm gonna read a question from the chat and this might get into like once you get into your beginning um well i guess you didn't start it you started right around this time it says oh shoot now there's another question i gotta scroll up it says um <laughs> What was it like running the fan sites when Elliot's global popularity suddenly grew during Goodwill Hunting? And then another question, um, Casey, did you have any conversations with Elliot? I was wondering this too, conversations with Elliot about your or other fan site and what did he think about them? Maybe that one first, like Casey, did you, did Elliot and you have any discussions about like, oh, I'm doing this site about you or did he express any kind of reservation or interest in it or anything or you i guess you too charlie yeah um like i was saying he was he was pretty much in the shadows like there was a couple times when he maybe once twice at most but he emailed me and said i have a couple shows coming up in new york city so he knew i had a way to communicate with people but he he wasn't saying, oh, here, we're going to send you a, a new release or want to preview some, help me preview some tracks or um, he was, you know, he was always just like kind of in depth. He was okay with it the same way he was okay with me uh, trading his music um, as long as we weren't profiting from it or he just wanted people. He didn't care if you shared music. He was okay with you recording his music at shows. Um, he just didn't want you to sell it. Um, and uh no, like I said, he just, he wasn't that technology tech savvy. Um, a lot of people weren't at the time. He was just more consumed with living, living and coming up with, ex you know, documenting his experience in his music. He had so many songs he was writing. He didn't, he didn't have much time to think about the internet. Uh, yeah. They're just working on songs all the time. I think. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, Charlie, do you want to like ease into like UK, you were, you know, we're getting to about the point where you discovered Elliot. Are you ready to move on to that? And because uh, um, that had to do with Goodwill Hunting, or you have a lot like 20 right. more questions for Casey from before. Oh, I got millions of questions for Casey. <laughs> no, um, well, I was kind of piggybacking off what Casey said. Um, I feel the same way um, that, that Elliot was in the shadows. Um, you know, at a certain point uh, later, like figure eight era, um, you know, I got to he hear from DreamWorks a little bit more and and especially Margaret Middleman, um, Elliot's manager. Um, um, secretly, uh, <laughs> I was doing updates on ElliotSmith.net, um, which Autumn um, DeWild did along with, um, oh my goodness, I I'm gonna hate myself for for forgetting his name, but uh, um, someone else who helped produce the uh, the the gosh, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, he helped produce a lot of the imagery uh, of Figure Eight. Um, uh, I they they built the website 
um, I went in there eventually and updated certain content with like news and images and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, same, same kind of like in the shadows, Elliot. Uh, it was only till later that I learned that that he did go to to least sweet Adeline as far as you know from my point of view, um, and look through it and uh, and edit things. <laughs> What he asked if it was Mike Mike Mills. Is that who you were thinking of? Uh, no, no, not Mike. Somebody Mills. said like, that. In the Mike chat. Mills was did that uh, did a lot of the early uh, promo stuff before Figure Eight uh, came out. But uh, no, they're gosh, I'm sorry, uh, but it, uh, oh, it, it, his last name is Smith for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but I for, I'm forgetting right now. But uh, and. Uh, so Elliot did like kind of visit the site. He actually did look around and check it out. And uh, didn't, didn't I remember yeah. hearing that he would like look at the set list and oh, oh yeah, that's a song I haven't played for a while. Or like he would kind of right. look at the set list printed, to remind him of things. He printed out tablature as well, you know, to, <laughs> to kind of, there, there, was, there was one piece of paper that was like a, I think he had it was like double sided. One side was him editing the website, and the other side was tablature. Uh, it, and it might have been a, a, a big star song um, that he was probably trying to learn play again. But uh, yeah, he would he he did use it as a reference um, at a certain point. So, uh, but you know, I was lucky to kind of like at a certain point just be you know being you know someone who went backstage and he knew uh, who i was for, for and what i did you know uh, at a at a certain point um so and he was very generous with i mean seriously just like i don't i'm uh, i could say i'm a no one you know i'm no one <laughs> uh but i can walk into i walked into uh like the last show, the last time I got to speak to him, you know, and and he he has all these celebrities, LA people, all that stuff, and he pulled me into like just to talk one on one. Yeah. <laughs> that was the kind of guy he was, you know. You know, he was a uh, he, he. I don't know what to say. Just it was he he had a tremendous world around him and. He was willing to <laughs> not worry about that. But I, just I can of... see him being prefer your company over a lot of Hollywood people. Let's just say that. Uh, I guess, yeah. <laughs> nice. I don't know, you know. But I'm uh, complimenting so... your pers your personality over the, the stereotype of Hollywood people. I guess. Oh, thank you. Um, but then. Um, <laughs> what was the first the first question that you, oh, oh about about the the fandom how things changed good with Will hunting. goodwill hunting and that's how you you learned you learned of him in the movie theater watching that movie right right that in but the reaction i think casey would be more well versed on under uh like knowing the the what happened you know like how fandom changed how uh, his you know life changed in in a way that now more people were probably visiting Casey's site and, and uh, you know that was one of my gateways to bothering him about about Elliot and and, and you know getting to know him through emails um, you know I think it changed probably Casey's life uh, in a way on the internet it changed my life of course because I, I become became a fan and and uh, and you know, just went hog wild looking into everything about Elliot, including he miser. So, yeah, Casey, did your site get a lot more people coming to it, emailing you, all that kind of stuff? A lot did a lot change with uh, Goodwill Hunting. Um, yeah, definitely a little more inquiries. I was always back then when we had websites, we would always check our traffic. So there was a lot of traffic spikes. I think after the Oscars, nothing, we, nothing mind boggling, but um, <laughs> I think at that point, yeah, I knew I was sort of sitting on something or 
there was there was also sort of a weird melancholy about seeing having known Elliot for so long and having kind of felt that he wasn't ready to play that didn't wasn't sure about playing the Oscars it was a weird surreal thing for people that for Elliot's community Elliot's friends and family and acquaintances who'd grown up with him the last the previous few years what what year was that that he played the Oscars 98 oh yeah so. Yeah, so that's been four four years since Umber Penumbra, but it was certainly cool. He played it off like whatever. I'm just gonna play Miss Misery. <laughs> I tried. I tried to get into. I didn't go to the Oscars to try to get in, but I, I wanted to go. I was like, <laughs> I gotta go. Like, I was a fan since '95. I had seen him play several times already. You know, at small, you know, shows before yeah. he got big and. I was like, I got to, I got to see him on the Oscars. And I wrote a letter to the Academy saying, and I was, I don't like to lie about anything. So I was like, I was really going to write an article if I, they let me in, but I said, Oh, I'm a freelance writer and I'm writing an article about Elliot Smith already. And like, this would really, you know, this is a big thing. And, you know, I'd like to be a part of the press to cover the, <laughs> the Academy Awards. Cause you know, he's, you know, I'm writing an article about him and I got a, the official answer they gave me was, oh, like it's way too, you know, cause they, they do the nominations pretty close to the time of the show a few months before. And they're like, oh, you had to write in like a year ago to, you know, it's like way past <laughs> the time to apply for a press thing. But for a couple of years, I got all these like press releases from the Academy Awards in my mailbox about <laughs> different Hollywood things. I wish I kept all that stuff. None of it was Elliot, Elliot related, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, even the nominees get like one ticket to take, like one family member or something. It's like it's unless you're like a seat filler or something, maybe I don't know. But it's almost impossible to just get into the Academy Awards. But I was really trying. So um, yeah, it changed. I mean, I saw him. I saw him in '97 at Spaceland was the first time I saw him not as an opening act for somebody. And it was like half full or three quarters full, you know, a place that holds 200 people that was like, you know, hundred people were there. And then right after the Academy Awards or maybe just before like early 98, he played Spaceland again. And there was a line like down the street and you could just feel like <laughs> the, but yeah, I mean, it changed as far as the amount of people that were there, but, I felt like the amount, the fans, I don't know, it still always had like an intimate, good feel. I didn't feel like it, oh, all these new fans, it's like ruining it or anything. You know, it, like everybody, it was still always like a good vibe at the shows for the most part, as far as like the way the fans kind of treated other fans and acted toward Elliot. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't really a bother other than having to see him in bigger places and stuff, but um um, I would like to jump in really quick, if that's okay. Um, and, and so, in in watching Goodwill Hunting and you know going through all the the motions of a uh, of uh, becoming a fan and stuff like that, you know, I, I went to Casey's site um, to learn more. You know, you know, obviously um, everything that helped me kind of pr progress and learn more was through Casey's site, and um, and one of the largest and very important moments that I took from Casey's side was the, you know, like tour dates. And, and at that time, uh, Elliot was touring, you know, in, in around April, May, maybe even June. Um, and, uh, and Casey posted the dates for the shows and, you know, how else would I have known, you know, the, cause I didn't know where else to look for Elliot Smith stuff. Um, that was updated on a regular ba basis. And so uh, <laughs> uh, there was a thing called Ticket Web where you would buy tickets. And, you know, thank thankfully, thanks to Casey, you know, I, you know, got to see Elliot, um, got to get tickets like right away because I thought I would sell out. And, uh, um, and I went to a show and I had the greatest time ever. And, you uh, a lot of what that, was your you know, first show? What was that first show you went to? Uh, it was <laughs> May 18th, 1998. It was at the bottom of the hill in San Francisco. 
and uh, which I'm sure Casey knows about. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I live and, right uh, here. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, like you know, that was that was a That's very amazing. important moment for me. Was he playing with a band? Quasi. Yeah. He was with Quasi. Oh, Quasi tour. Yeah, so Quasi open. Elliot yeah. played solo acoustic, but then uh, and then uh, and then Quasi backed him up. And there's a really good, one of the better, one of the best uh, Elliot Smith bootlegs is from that show. And uh, I'm happy. Really? It, soundboard? It, it sounds great. Huh? The soundboard? Soundboard, yes. Uh -huh. It's really, it's really great. If I, if you would like a copy of it, totally. Get it. So Elliot <laughs> plays for sure. I'm, Elliot plays a few acoustic songs and then, then, then they play electric together. Yes. Uh -huh. It was awesome. <laughs> is, that, is that how he was? I remember seeing uh, at Irving Plaza, probably the same tour, such a m much bigger venue than Bottom of the Hill, like yeah, four feet bigger. Um, we're talking like 200 versus like 2,000 almost. Or oh, maybe, wow. Maybe 15, maybe 1,500. Quite big. Had wow. a balcony and big floor. But I, I remember, yes. Uh, What's his name? The bass player for Quasi, Sam? No, Sam Coombs. Yeah, Sam Coombs. Yeah, but I don't recall Elliot doing acoustic stuff. Maybe he did a couple numbers uh, as a, as an encore. But um, in fact, you know, he wasn't playing with Quasi then. They were just backing him. It was uh, Janet and Sam. Oh yeah, so it's, okay. As just as a band. As as yeah, the full electric band. Yeah. Thing. How how many shows did you end up seeing? By, by just uh, I, I haven't really gone back to count, and I can't even remember where where the first. I mean, the first time I saw him live was at the Umber show that I got to record, which is pretty crazy. But um, probably not more than fifteen. Either yeah, acoustic. You know, I, I saw him a couple times, lot like solo in New York City as well. Um, yeah. But he didn't play many so. I wonder what, what year was that when he stopped playing, doing the solo tour? And was after the self type stuff? Uh, like, you mean just you mean just by himself, just playing yeah, on the show? By yeah. Um, he would play, he would play shows by himself here and there. I know, I know before figure eight came out, he played Bottom of the Hill and he did all that was all acoustic. I, yeah, I think at the Roxy and L too right before figure eight was acoustic and then of course when later on in 2001 uh to 2003 he was he mostly played by himself as well sometimes he would have a, a drummer that would that would back him up but, but for the most part uh he um after figure eight tour he he uh, played by himself um so uh, one of the things is uh, that I wanted to ask too is like, uh, so you kind of were kind of uh, kind of transitioning both in and out here and there um, uh, with updating the site. And I was just wondering if, if uh, was there any kind of changes that, that you were feeling about like wanting to, to, to update the site anymore at certain point? I think that's when you showed up on the scene. Well, I think you're so, <laughs> really, I think, I think well, at some point, yeah, I, I sort of felt like I, ex I exhausted my abilities as a web designer or as a, as a way to um, keep it going and up to date because I said, you kept, you kind of leapfrogged me after about a year, your site was up and it was pretty minimalist, but then you were up, you started updating yours quite a bit more than mine. Um, not as much, not as much the multimedia content, but more just right. lyric, all the lyrics, all the discog discography, uh, tour dates, a lot of, lot of copy, a lot of text, a lot of good stuff. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, deep. I had a lot of time at a certain point. <laughs> yeah, where were, you doing, where were you doing all your updates? Were you doing that as a, like moonlighting on the side at work or doing it at home? I was doing it at home. I, I moved to LA and um, 
because I wanted to, you know, be a part of the business, you know, um, in media, like I wanted to be in movies and music and or something, you know, relatable to public relations and communication studies. And, um, but I didn't handle LA well, so kind of had panic attacks. <laughs> and so I would hide at home really and, and it actually uh, build the site, a lot of the content when I was at home as I was trying to like look around for jobs and stuff. What time period uh, but, were you in LA, Charlie? Um, 99. No, no. Yeah. At the end of 99 or 98. I'm sorry. At the end of 98. Um, I mean, I it was probably, yeah, I don't, I never knew that, but I was probably just, yeah. your site wasn't up that long. So I probably, I might not even have known you by name yet at that point. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I might have just known the site yeah so unfortunately um I uh you know I came back to the area I live in now and uh, by then I had I had done a lot of the content in all in both in San Francisco San Francisco is really where I started it but um uh LA is where it really took off because of what I was dealing with in LA Somebody oh. asked if you met Elliot while you were in LA. Did you see no, him no. personally or at a show? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I didn't get to to have that opportunity. I, I, you know, funny enough, actually, um, before I moved to LA, I did see him in San Diego, um, and then you know, just weeks or months or a month later, I moved down to to LA and. I think he he was probably on the East Coast or not touring at that time, and um, you know, I was just um, I was interning at a at a, uh, a at a at a small label, and um, but a, a a famous label. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's uh, uh, famous for you know releasing a lot of emo music and uh, and selling it and. Uh, but I just couldn't handle the the environment of LA, so I came back here and 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 kept it, kept it going basically. Um, so yeah. <laughs> did you have a lot of technical skill? Where did you learn your your web skills? I I took a class in um, in at school. I went to Sacramento State University in and uh, in California uh, and. Uh, so I took a website class there, but, you know, again, like, uh, I was looking at a lot of coding and, um, you know, looking at everybody's background. Um, at, at first I, I did like kind of cheat <laughs> and, 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 uh, copy and paste. Um, eventually I got like a program called, uh, uh what's it called P page mill. I don't know if you remember Adobe page mill, uh, which, then blended into Adobe Dreamweaver. And so, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's one of the frustrating things about uh, doing the site on those old platforms is that, you know, it's not not so easy to, to update anymore and, and, up, and, you know, send it through FTP, you know, to update the site um, you know, versus the way things are now. But, yeah, that's where I, I learned. Um, it was, a lot, it was but, a lot of physical labor. Remember, like updating, yeah. <laughs> and up, uploading, FTPing your stuff up to the servers. Exactly. I like, a, I remember. Uh, so when XO and, and I learned this from your site, uh, when XO came out, um, the vinyl version came out before the CD version, or whatever versions they had at yeah. the time. And uh, I had my, my friend has a scanner and we, we put the whole vinyl one side, scanned that one side, <laughs> flipped it over, scanned it, and then put it together and uh, as one and blended it somehow. He, he was better at, uh, at doing uh, Photoshop and doing design. And so we, we were able to make the album cover but it didn't shrink it to be very super small because of the 
to do, you know, the download speeds were so, <laughs> so yeah. uh, low that, you know, we did all this work just for, for you know, the, the most tiniest uh, album covers where you probably couldn't even see the line that we blended. <laughs> so, so again, like, like you said, you know, I didn't hit, I didn't do any of the, the audio video or any of that because I didn't have the, the, the ability or the knowledge and, and that's um, what, you know, take, I took from Casey's side, it was just like, you know, whoa, that was amazing that that content was on there. Um, the only reason, like there was some video on the website um, was when, uh, you know, like there was sites you could link to <laughs> more than, than having it on the site it, itself. So if the link went down then, or they changed the link, yeah. And then you were done. <laughs> you had to kind of find another link to replace that that content. And then, yeah, again, unfortunately, a lot of things on the site today are missing links or broken links because of those those reasons. You know, things have changed. Do you at some point, Elliot? His content, what a lot of the video content was on his official site, though, right? But you. It wasn't Sweet Adeline, was it? No, it, uh, originally there was. Um, so the the EXO, the one Alphabet Town, did yeah, have video. Yeah. Um, the Figure Eight one, uh, ElliotSmith.net, uh, kind of <coughs> shied away f more from that. But they they did have like some stuff like the Conan Conan O'Brien performance and stuff like that at the time. <laughs> I think maybe a VH1. Uh, 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 interview as well so um, but yeah they they didn't have as much uh, video and again uh, you know that's why your site is so amazing because you had that content and it was there all the time <laughs> it's probably and it's kind of there still in that archive or um, you know like you know, whatever like GIF you made, um, um, you know, some of those are still there. I can still see it moving. <laughs> those, were, so. those were my masterpieces, those Elliot Smith GIFs. Yeah. GIFs yeah. were, well, big, that was a big deal back then. Making a yeah. GIF, like, so I would like pull little screenshots from his videos and put little, uh, cause yeah, you'd put up a GIF instead of a video because that was bandwidth friendly. Yes, <laughs> and so it, it made a big difference. And and if you go back to those uh, videos from from the Alphabet Town <laughs> website, which I wish Interscope would find a way to to maybe you know bring them back and and uh, and have a better quality than they they are now. Um, you know, there were, there's funny moments. There's cute moments. There's moments. Elliot's recording uh, figure eight. There's uh, the, the song figure eight and, um, and vocals for, um, you know, uh, be, you know, the, the cover of, of the Beatles because, um, you know, which is, you know, it's awesome. <laughs> you know, there's awesome moments, there's fun moments that, but they're just so pixelated, you know, at this point, it's just like, oh, I wish, wish you could uh, see newer versions of, of those awesome videos. What, what was that video? I felt it was a seminal moment in Elliot's career when that movie came out. I, I can't remember what it's called, but it was, it was a gem cone. It's not Lucky Three, but it was like a feature length film. Maybe uh, it was Strange just, Parallel. Strange Parallel. Uh -huh, can you Steve talk Pat. about that? When that came can, out? Can you talk can about I, that? Yeah. Like a, like a, I, I can only, Robot, the only yeah. thing I can talk about is that I have it. I have it, uh, I was lucky, uh, actually, oh gosh. Do you remember Erica Far Fargo, Fargo? Yeah. Do you remember that name? Remember the name, yeah, who was she? Yeah, uh, she, well, she was a fan of Elliot's and she actually right. worked at Propaganda uh, Films that I think helped distribute a lot of those videos and Steve Haft uh, created strange parallel and 
that was one of the films that was in their archives. And I was lucky enough to, to, for her to send me a videotape uh, of it. And I still have the, I still have it of, of the recording. Um, uh, I, you know, aside from that, I don't, I don't know much about the, the process of, of it being done and created, which, you know, I think it would be awesome to, to hear from Steve about, about, that process um because it's so unique it's so <laughs> unusual and i'm sure there you know that information is spread out and uh, about how that came together but um uh, I, I know that oh go ahead i'm sorry Kate. no no but was that steve hampt is he the guy who worked with beck yeah did that videos yeah or is he yeah a, well, is funny video enough person? him and ross harris uh worked with beck you know <laughs> so there's that kind of like connection as well. Uh, so, but yes, I believe Ross, they both. What was the connection to Elliot with Ross Harris again? So Ross Harris uh, uh, did Coming Up Roses video. Oh. Right. Um, did some Heat Miser videos and he did Miss Misery as well uh, video. And so, Casey, somebody had a question for you, Casey. It says, can you, to backtrack, can you talk about the singer-songwriter scene slash community in Portland around the time you saw Elliot at Umbra Penumbra? There seems to be a lot out there about the scene Heat Miser was a part of, but I don't know much about Elliot's contemporaries besides Mary Lou Lord and a few others he toured with. Yeah, I, try, I, I talked a little bit about that, but just, I mean, the other artists that he would play with like uh that he's done some collaborations with on some singles pete krebs and sean krogan i mean they're two two really good friends of him and sean they was were, in cracker bash right or yeah sean's in cracker bash and hey and yeah pete and pete was in hazel, hazel yeah. some other stuff you know those guys i was just always thinking man if we could get them on a zoom call because they have so many stories they just um were so intimately involved with Elliot in his Portland years on like a daily basis. I think Elliot and Pete were roommates or one or the other or Sean and, and then Sean and Elliot were like dug ditches for some construction company. And anyway, they're just, those two guys know Elliot better than a lot of people. Um, but I know they're pretty protective, but uh <laughs> But you, if you go to Portland, you go to some bars or pre-COVID, you would probably run into these guys and they would tell you an anecdotal thing about Elliot. Um, but yeah, like you were, like we were saying, the Spinanes, Hazel, I mean, the, the scene was, it was very competitive. Um, I'm not sure what can, was, it must've been pre-Nirvana. No, well, Kurt Cobain, I mean, he committed suicide in 90, was 93 or something, right? Or died in 90, 93. 94, 94, I think. It was 94, yeah. So anyway, we were in Portland. I mean, we were living under the shadow of the Seattle grunge scene. And we were always trying to do that. Portland was trying to do something a little bit different. And it always did. It was just a lot more unique, a lot, a lot more eccentric and weird. And yeah, Portland was just a really small, funky town. And there were some really cool clubs that there were only a few clubs that people played at, like the X-ray Cafe on Burnside. Um, Satiricon. Satiric, yeah, Satiricon. I think I saw Elliot there play once. I even played there once or twice. But uh, anybody could play there, really. There were a lot of musicians, and um, it was just a really cool time. It rained a lot. It was pretty dark and spooky, and uh, craft. There was a lot of craft beer coming out and people were uh, very creative, but it was really clicky. And eventually I, um, I kind of wanted to get out of there. It was a little bit insular. And that's when I was sort of thinking about moving back East, back to New York. But even today, I mean, Port I mean, I don't know who's come out of Portland um, and made it as a musician. December is, uh, I mean, that's <laughs> okay. That's December is, yeah, they're pretty amazing. <laughs> I don't know. That's still a long time ago that they came out of there, but. Yeah, but I mean, there was a lot of bands before that, before uh, indie rock that were made Portland famous. I'm forgetting who they are at the moment. There's a couple, there were two bands that were very famous rock bands. Um, uh, 
the wipers, was, maybe. Yeah, dead, dead, moon. Thinking. dead moon for sure. So to bring up a sore subject, um, uh, as, as the site was continuing, uh, you know, both of us uh, eventually uh, um, found out about Elliot's death. And I was just curious, a um, couple things. So one was, uh, you know, how you, how you kind of found out and how you felt. And, um, and you know, part of it I wanted to ask you is that, is that your site also continued through 2006, um, uh, as far as I, I saw. Um, what kind of motivated you to keep going um, after that, that tragedy? So wait, did, you, did you look it up on the archive that it was, I just don't recall actually updating it quite at all after that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it has its, it has its, it, like it, it falls off at 2006 and like there's no updates from that point on. But there is, you know, there is a time that that you worked on the site after Elliot passed, and and um, continue continue to update it as well. Yeah, I have to go back to to my own archives. But I mean, when I found out, yeah, I just I found out like the the day it happened before it was announced, like on the newswire, someone I knew had known El what her friend lived in LA and so she got a call and then I got a call um but yeah it was it was devastating and super shocking and just kind of just just really overwhelming to have to deal with that on your before everyone else really knew about it it was even a little bit more eerie but right. I don't know I feel like the whole year before people I mean, in retrospect, it was a huge surprise to me, but the more I read into things and learned things that a lot of people were not su that surprised that this eventually happened. And uh, it was a long time coming for Elliot, but, but I always tell people, you know, that Elliot made a huge, you know, he, he kind of just had a, he made a horrible mistake in that moment and had a mental breakdown. I don't know what was going on with his girlfriend that might have triggered that but I know it wasn't a, any sort of homicide anyway it's just it's just really really hard to process but we are so so obviously lucky that he left so much great music it was around for the time that he was right and so what uh and since you had continued on I mean like what what do you feel did you feel like that you needed to kind of be there for fans or to, to, you know, I don't I actually, if I feel like I draw a huge blank and like everything that's happened on my website, I'm sorry, I should have researched that since it's <laughs> because in 2007, I'm trying to re remember um, that was probably a pivotal point for me. Uh, I had just moved to the Bay area. I left New York in like 2000, right after I, uh, couple of year, year and a half after 9-11, I moved back to the Northwest. <clears throat> My parents were up there and I ended up in Seattle. And um, man, it's a really vague, vague memories of update. I don't, I, I feel like the site just kept going and I was paying the hosting fees. And uh, I don't, I don't really, there may have been some stuff that I updated around, um, you know, around his posthumous releases. But mm -hmm. do you remember? I don't like, remember exactly all of it, uh, yeah. but I, you know, I, I didn't get to kind of like view it like exactly, but definitely, yeah. you know, it, it from a basement on the hill and stuff like that was mentioned on, on it yeah. and that it was coming out and stuff. So yeah, so there were there, there was some updates on there about it. But I just that, remember, that yeah, I think I do the, the last my reconnection is yeah the other the the, the months preceding basement on the hill. I was just so excited that that was coming out and you know his friends were helping to release that but when that came out I was just so blown away it's like Elliot came back to life that that album just was so amazing I and, uh, totally agree <laughs> it was just off the charts just in so many yeah. different directions like just obviously very sad because there was so much stuff he was unveiling as a musician that we had never seen before and God just showed that he had 
you know, exponentially more potential. So <laughs> that's the sad part. Um, anyway. So kind of before what getting about you? into- what, what's your, What was your reaction? Uh, <laughs> uh, to his death or to- Well, yeah, just sort of what I answered. Or yeah. how did you find out? Well, I found out um, in a weird way. Um, someone emailed me and said, uh, sorry for your loss. And, um, but this was like, like kind of like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock ish. It felt like, um, and, uh, I hadn't gotten those emails before because Elliot had gone through a lot in the prior years, you know, with the drug abuse and what he was going through and stuff like that. And, um, dealing with, and so, you know, I, I, I was just like, didn't take it seriously. I was like, oh, here's another one, you know. Um, so I continued my day. Uh, and then I started getting, and I went to dinner and I got calls, like calls from, from people. And I was just like, I, I didn't want to interrupt my dinner. <laughs> but then as it continued and thinking about earlier, I was just like, I need to take a call. I need to, to see what's going on here because it's blowing up too much. And um, and uh, a friend of mine, Daphne, um, said, "Hey, have you heard?" And I'm all like, "What?" And they said, "Like uh, people from DreamWorks are looking for you. They want to talk to you." And so, so I excused myself from the dinner and went home because I, you know, obviously had some some clue. Oh, what, what was going on um and uh you know i ended up in my house and uh uh got uh, luke wood actually was the one who's re reaching out to me through his uh his assistant um steve and uh and then eventually you know i got to luke but luke had to put me on hold because i think he was going in between ashley and jennifer and um and then then he basically got on the phone and and said that that the rumor, you know, why, you know, do you know why I'm calling? And I said I think so. And and, um, and he said, yeah, it's true. It's you know that that, that happened. And um, you know, and then there was some discussion about how to to make it official, like to tell everybody, because it at that point it had we we uh, had a discussion board on. Um, you know, as a part of the site, it, it, it is uh, run by uh, another great band um, by the name of Aaron, and uh, it was crashing his uh, discussion board because uh, people were trying to confirm and trying because at that point people were looking for the info. And uh, so Luke, I think, talked to Ashley and then Jennifer, and then called me back and and said that for me to go ahead and post something about about that it was true and uh you know obviously it was super devastating i mean tears <laughs> what i wrote was very personal it wasn't like a news you know it wasn't a news uh cast or whatever a news post and um you know but yeah I mean, kind of confirmed it and and, and uh, that's how it went. And, um, but, you know, I kind of echo the, you know, I felt like I had to be there for fans because, you know, I wanted, I, I understood <laughs> where they were probably at as if I was feeling a certain way. So, you know, I did my best to kind of update everybody about like, um, like memorials. I, did you happen to go to, the memorial at, at, the, at the park in New York? Did, I guess, yeah, I was, yeah. I actually made a bunch of little posters for of Elliot, a little old, and set them up outside a couple of his venues um, in the Lower East Side. My friend and I walked around. Yeah, we went to the one in, in Union School, no, Tompkins Square, whatever, the park in the East Village. Right, People yeah, there's a park. 
It was like yeah, everybody we, gathered around a tree kind of. Thing. Yeah, yeah. I was there for a little bit. Yeah, it was it was nice. It was nice. And there was someone on acoustic and they're passing it around playing Elliot songs. Um and then I put up these little memorials. I printed out some some color photos of him and uh I think I laminated it or something. Anyway, I put them on a couple of different designated spots in the East Village with some candles and yeah, I felt like That's I awesome. had, had to yeah. do that. It was cool. Yeah, the awesome. guy was from the same Tompkins Square Park. Yeah, that was where that, where the official memorial was. Right. And then eventually, I went time, to the, yeah. um, <laughs> um, went to the wall, and I was. Uh, oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah, you know, there was there was a little private thing between friends and family that I, I was lucky to go to, and um, and then um, then they had they had a concert. <laughs> which was difficult for everybody because I was very soon after he passed and everybody all the musicians were having a hard time playing it was uh, it's hard enough to play Elliot's music let alone with so much emotion behind it you know and trying to get through the songs and stuff like that but that was um, in LA at the um what venue was that I think it uh Henry Fonda Henry Fonda yeah. memorial yeah. show and people were playing Elliot songs Yes, they were covering covering them. Like Good John Doe, Doe, Beck was there. Um, yeah, there's a good number of people, and uh, but yeah, definitely you know tried my best to be there um, to kind of let everybody know what, what was happening, what was possible, you know, tributes and all that stuff that were that you know fans were kind enough to do, and you know that bled into memorial funds and uh, you know like the Elliott Smith Memorial Fund and advertising that stuff and 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 uh, helping out with that stuff so um, you know there, there was a certain point that I didn't feel like I maybe uh, had a break from it <laughs> but yeah uh, but like you know like you were saying um, you know like from a basement on the hill was a very relieving thing a very um thing that 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 was very important for me and whatever i had to deal with to 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 get through because that album was amazing it was a what they did what joanna and rob did to help that be what it, it is was amazing so thankful for that <laughs> and uh you know again you know, I still love Elliot's music. Uh, you know, and I'm so happy that things are continuing to this to this last year, which you, hopefully we can talk about now. Maybe <laughs> is um, uh, uh, there. I I have a point of view about your contribution to the the uh, the the release of the cassette on on the 25th anniversary of the subtitle. Um, but uh, but I wanted to hear how how it came together for you to be involved and and basically bring back that tape, um, be involved. I don't I don't know if you uh, what the whole process was for you to to basically come back and and uh, be a part of that that uh, that release and bring something in that was awesome. Um, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we, um, Larry, Larry Crane got in touch with me probably about a year and a half before they asked me, before Kill Rockstars got in touch with me. It was always, Larry was the point person. Larry's the owner of Jackpot Records and he worked with, just to tell people, I, I actually got to go there way back in the day. I just showed up in Portland one day and went to, Larry's studio just to connect with the space that Elliot had recorded probably Miss Misery in right and some earlier yeah. stuff and Elliot was part owner of that studio um, he and Larry put it together right up right up to like hanging drywall and Elliot was there's photos of Elliot painting that studio really famous place I'm not sure I'm sure it's, it is still there I think it moved from uh, well there was there's basically two locations there's the original location now there's a newer location yeah um, yeah that's our, the original one and like a little a little house but uh -huh, um, yes. 
but yeah, this is not much of a story other than like Larry had been in touch with me. He knew I had that recording and I think he was trying, he was in charge of archiving and his, the family, the estate of Elliot, which is run by Elliot's family, put Larry in charge of um, putting together, you know, the archive stuff of important recordings. And one of them was, they wanted this Elliot. He just started, he reached out and he wanted a recording and he wanted to, to master it or get it in better better condition or get it into the archive. Um, but it wasn't really being spoken of as a release of any sort. So it wasn't until about a year later uh, that he reached out to me and said, yeah, they're talking about releasing as a B-side to the um, 25th anniversary Elliot Smith release. So yeah, I was, I was interested. They gave me a teeny tiny bit of money for it and uh, <laughs> like, a, like a few hundred dollars. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't ask for more, but it was a nice token. So then it was officially theirs and now it's part of the it's part of the archive. And then he we went we had to go back and forth on whether or not I had the right recording. Um, and then he asked me a lot about the process and who was there and the date specifics. We just wanted to get the liner notes down correctly. So but yeah, it pretty much all Larry, he did that whole thing. Yeah. I just sent a couple of cassettes back and forth. What's that? Were you excited? Like, it, did it just like uh, energize you? You know, like uh, in the sense of because uh, I, you know, I, I'll ask you about what you're doing now in a sec. But you know, like I, I saw you wearing a New Moon T-shirt when you started your the business that that, that you have now. And I mean, to be kind of back in, in such a important role in bringing something like that. Um, did that, Hold on. Did that, was it pretty awesome for you? I think he just said, Hold on, did he go away? Yeah, I think he's at work. Yeah, <laughs> Hold on, um, I just gotta go outside. Oh, no problem. Okay, are you guys still there? Yeah, yes. Restaurants right. closing down. There There's a lot of people. Um, yeah, I mean, it was sort of a um, a long time coming to get recognition on that. And actually, for me, I never really released anything on my my little Skylash label, so that was pretty big deal. To finally, released something, <laughs> and it was Elliot's recording. So it it was a big deal. Yeah, it really brought brought everything full circle for me from my Portland years as a musician and then trying to make it as a musician and start a little label. It did, it did really, it did surprise me though. It was odd. It's an odd thing <laughs> to be a part of um, because it had been busy. You know, everyone had heard that album. And I was just, was, I guess I was honored that it was the very first recording that people recognized of Elliot and I, you know, I didn't know that was the case. I just knew he was an amazing musician. And when I heard, heard uh, Roman Candle just really engaged me and wanted to learn those songs. And yeah, and someone asked, what's my favorite song? I think it was, I let the time and still one of my top Elliot songs is from Roman Candle. Uh, I believe it's No Name Number Four. You know, I, I re actually request the song during that recording. You can barely hear me, but I always like <laughs> super sloppy with name titles. So I just throw out a lyric. So I said, he said, hey, I don't know what to play. Um, I don't know what to play. You'll hear him say this. And, and then I, in the background, I say, cowboy boots. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's no name number. That's no name number four. <laughs> or number, is that number four or three or what? on top of my head I can't. whatever it is <laughs> yeah but then he's he's like yeah, cowboy right. boots yeah and then he just goes right into it <laughs> Char yeah so charlie somebody asked somebody asked in the chat all three of our favorite songs so I, I know it's like the hardest question do you want me to go next mm -hmm. I, yeah i mean you, go for it. i think all of us everybody that's watching could choose like 50 songs as their favorite song but i 
I generally lately say um, it's unreleased song, but everybody, people know it. You make it seem like nothing or come to me. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the ones that have multiple titles, fan titles, but you make it seem like nothing. I, I love that song. I like the, I think it's, I like Elliot's um, songs that have more. Oh, yeah. oh gosh, what has happened? I hear myself all weird. Um, more, um, uh, you know, abstract lyrics, but that one is very kind of straightforward lyric. Like, um, uh, I can't help you when you're sad. That, that whole verse, um, that's a constant source of pain to me because I want to really bad. It's less like, uh, that's my favorite, but I mean, you know, all the ones that are everybody's favorite and uh, Angela can say yes and <laughs> some song and, uh, you know, even other unreleased ones. Um, but yeah, I usually go with uh, you make it seem like nothing. I think um, for me, um, you know, the first song that kind of intro introduced me to Elliot was Angelus. And and I talked about it in the, uh, my favorite Elliot Smith uh, song podcast. And um, someone had actually picked that song before I did. And then, of course, I had to stick to my guns and say it. Can you say that's my favorite song? <laughs> but um, it, had I got to choke choose another song I would have said uh, the enemy is you as oh. a song too because um, great song I, yeah I think it's a very personal song and you know it has its has its things that you can relate to as many Elliot songs um, have and um, so I Angel wish I picked that. Uh, oh I love Angel in the Snow that was an awesome That's song too. like just proving the point of Elliot's great songwriting like i mean the most famous songs that he has are not you make it seem like nothing the enemy is you and no name number four you know it's like <laughs> i mean nobody's gonna argue that those three are awesome songs but like, if you ask yeah. uh, average ellie you know not average uh, you know casual elliot smith fan they might not know any of those and he's got i tried to make a top like 10 favorite songs or something a few months ago and i i got you know it's hard to even get rid of some and i got down to like 38 songs that i had to like never narrow down <laughs> to a top 10 um it was, a lot of songs it was too hard yeah yeah the enemy is you i was almost gonna say that in my list of other favorite there wait you have, you have a list of 38 that was your top narrow down <laughs> i don't know i made a list on my phone okay i gotta make like a top 10 and like you know some yeah. that didn't make that top 38 were still painful to not make it but like you know <laughs> do uh, you guys know how many elliot songs there are i don't yet <laughs> working Just starting now? what's the, what's the no. average what's the rough guess over i mean it's not it almost depends, like, you know, original songs, some songs have multiple versions. It's like, there's a lot of gray yeah. area. <laughs> there's a lot yeah. of gray area as far as like with the unreleased ones and stuff like that. No, I mean total. Yeah, total original songs. I wonder how many that is. Well, yeah. the Alphabet Town, current Alphabet Town website is a good place to start, but th that, that lists like every single song he's been involved in but that's like if he like played guitar on somebody's album or something so you have to sort of like weed those yeah. ones out if you want to go for like just his songs and stuff and like any cover he did even like rumored covers when he was 15 it's got like all these things so um yeah i'm sort of working on a different page to list more like what you're talking about um but yeah there's a lot. <laughs> There's just so many. There's so many unreleased ones. It's crazy. My friend who's like yeah. a moderate, you know, pretty big fan, but not as into it. And I sent him this YouTube video that has like an hour and a half of unreleased songs. I was like, this is a pretty good like starting point for unreleased songs that you might not have heard of some of them. And that hour and a half video of unreleased songs still had a lot of good ones missing. Where's that? Where is that? Uh, 
That was just some, YouTube. some YouTube video, like Elliot oh, Smith on release. Somebody said 200 to 300 songs. Yeah. I mean, if you don't yeah. count cover, you know, he played so many covers live, but if you're talking about songs he wrote, I mean, then there's like the pre heat miser ones. So yeah, there's a few hundred, I mean, for sure. So. I, I, I mean, I generally, I mean, uh, Casey, I just want just wondering what the journey has meant to you at this point. What the journey has meant to me? Yeah. Um, well, I, it's really created a lot of friendships for me and a lot of musical connections in my brain and in my heart. And it's really he's really helped me as a musician. I mean, I feel like the website and yeah, that helped me a lot. I, I, I now and because I did for about ten years work in multimedia and web and promote uh, online advertising. And, you know, it was because of Elliot's site really that catapult that was a catalyst to get me into that field and proving ground. And I'm still not a very good web designer, but but I've always designed my own. Still, always to this day, never paid anyone to do a website. Um, and yeah, it's just um, yeah. I mean, the guy is Elliot's just he's just a magical guy. And for me, I feel really privileged having grown up, having spent that time in Portland, um, to have met him in in his infancy there, and to be part of that scene. Um, it was such a long time ago for me, but yeah, I'm super lucky for that experience. And, uh, I mean, I now own a restaurant and it's totally disconnected, but we do play a lot of Elliot. <laughs> Occasionally people will walk in and recognize, uh, we also play a lot of beach house and a lot of jazz and a lot of, uh, other stuff. Spotify tells you to play, but <laughs> But you, uh, what's that? Oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, I was just there was a pause. Just go ahead. I was just gonna say, can you talk talk to us about what you're doing now? And um, I, I, I've seen that from what the journey I've seen uh, in what you're doing now has again amazing. <laughs> like I, I remember seeing pictures of of you having just basically a, a table. Uh, yeah, in the street to where you're at now. So I, uh, I don't know if you would like yeah, to I mean, I'm promote what you're up. doing now. It's been about ten years since I had my I've had my pizza business. Yeah, so started on the streets of San Francisco as like a pop up pizza maker outside bars, and uh, then we built a, a pizza truck in 2000. Like within about five years, we had a pizza truck business when food trucks were super popular. I was like, when they were just gaining traction, like 2012. Anyway, and um, yeah, I mean, sat, and then now in 2017, we opened this restaurant. It's been almost, it's been three years now. So this pandemic, it's been rough, but luckily we're a pizza place and people still order quite a bit. We're just obviously doing takeout. But I have to say though, man, if it, being in the restaurant food business, it has really kind of sadly taken me away from music and I don't play really at all. I was, I did pick up the guitar today. I started stumbling upon, I was trying to play a Fleet Foxes song. And then, and then I just realized I was playing XO or the part of it. It was really bizarre. <laughs> and then I just pulled up the tab to XO. Cause I, I used to do a lot of Elliot covers. And I have a couple, couple little things on YouTube where I put up covers that I did back in the day. Got like a say yes cover. But yeah, I guess I still I still want it, my journey in music. I still want to get back to. I really need to. I have a kid now. He's three years old. So there's there's that. I want to get him into music. <laughs> but I, I spent a lot of time taking care of him where I'm at the restaurant. So. But, you know, it's funny. He really got into Elliot Smith. Um, he, he needs to take a nap. He's still young. So we drive in the car. He's not as much into He doesn't ask for Elliot as much anymore. But he always would ask for Elliot. I'd put on like um on uh, either or man you put on between the bars or just any sort of elliot it really it was it's like it's it's uh lullabies it's lullaby music <laughs> but he, he's like he just like put on elliot smith put on elliot elliot and you know this is a kid who's like barely three years old at the time it's 
pretty funny. But then his mom found out, it was Tom and I aren't together, his mom found out that I told El, I told my son that Elliot wasn't around, he had died. And um, and this might be morbid, but I told him, I said, and he said, how did he die? I said, well, he cut himself. <laughs> and he, uh -huh. and he, and his mom, his mom flipped out. Um, <laughs> thought I was, she thought I was telling the mom that I was teaching him about suicide or this or that. And like, how awful. But no, I was just telling my son that, you know, people, people make mistakes. People have, there's accidents. But anyway, um, yeah, so hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll get back into music and start recording again. I really do miss that. But restaurant is pretty, pretty, pretty all consuming sometimes. Yeah. And it's in San Francisco. Uh, I think, I'm in, is it where, where exactly? Wait, are you in San Francisco uh, too, by the way? No, no, no. I'm in Marina, but I, I just for anybody, if, if say someone comes wait, into wait. San Francisco. Oh, yes. Uh, maybe is it in San by. Francisco? Yeah. Let's go near the ball, near the ballpark, near um, Oracle Arena. It's called no, the 18th um, Giant Stadium. Yeah, we're in this neighborhood called Mission Bay, which is right on the outskirts of um, South of Market, Soma, Dog Patch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. cool. And I, I've been there. The people. Where are you? Where are you, Charlie? I, I live in uh, Marina, California, so I'm I'm uh, near oh, Monterey, so about a few hours away from okay. San Francisco. So, yeah. How many? Hours? Two hours, right? About two hours. It's not yeah. far. We got we got to meet up. Definitely, I would love to. I I tried once, <laughs> but like I missed you. So, I tried so you to came to the pizza place. Yeah, I came to. Did you come to, to the? Pizza place? Yeah, uh, I sat at I sat at one of the tables. <laughs> are you serious? I, yeah, I have a, a one of the, uh, your uh, like uh, coasters? coasters over there. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, Sorry. I was there, but unfortunately, I, I came on the wrong day. <laughs> oh man, I'm sorry. That's okay. I hopefully next time. We'll... Was it good? Did you like the pizza? It was absolutely great. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> so highly recommended to everybody who visits San Francisco. Please see Casey and go to Thank Casey's Pizza. But uh, I don't. I don't know, uh, Jeff. Do you, do you have anything else? Or you know? oh, so my wife said somebody asked Elliot's favorite pizza. I don't know. Well, Elliot's favorite pizza was Casey didn't have Casey's pizza then to serve to him, so I don't know. Charlie might have that inside information. No, I think I wasn't lucky enough. What's your get, favorite pizza? I say, oh, I'm so boring. Pepperoni and pe mushroom. That's oh, mushroom. We always get half cheese for the kids and half mushroom for us. But I like just plain yeah. cheese too. But mushroom. It's, yeah. <laughs> So, what's uh, Casey? No. What's your favorite pizza, Casey? Because uh, uh, a question was asked if uh, if you knew Elliot's favorite pizza was. <laughs> uh, I don't think I did. No, I don't know what. I'm not sure what it would be. <laughs> I don't know. I never. I never really saw Elliot eat any food in my. I don't think I've ever seen him <laughs> eating. Only drinking beer, <laughs> smoking cigarettes. Did you ever see him eating anything? Only in a picture, yeah. I think. Yeah, I posted a picture yeah. today from a magazine where he was eating a burrito or something. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like the biggest smile I've seen of him in a in a picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd be burrito, baby. He was eating well, a lot. Yeah, he liked Mexican food. I think he was super, he was on his way to becoming pretty healthy in California. But you know, just one thing I wanted to say, a lot of people who get, who learn about Elliot or no, they, they the legacy they hear about Elliot is that he did a lot of drugs. He wrote music about drugs, and he's a loser because he killed himself. You know, that's like the sad, well, you know, minuscule very per perspective from some people who don't really know him, or that, or people who do like him say, "Oh, he did a lot of drugs. That's why his music's about drugs." But you know, I wasn't quite sure. Like you know, "Needle in the Hay" and some other things, "The White Lady Loves You More." Like a lot of these songs that were about say heroin or addiction were all written before he really dabbled in this stuff. And I just kind of want to set the record straight from what I know is that Elliot, you know, wasn't a drug user when he wrote some of his greatest songs, 
that dealt that talked about drugs or use it as the metaphor but he was just sure. using it as a metaphor in his lyrics and it was drug use later way later that got the best of them yeah i think a lot of the you know the diehard fans know that but it's just an, yeah you know people that don't like you said people that don't know that don't know that much or delve into finding out the history kind of will think but i think other, that, will think that, otherwise but I think it was, I don't know what book it was. There was a book about a, a biography on Elliot that kind of clarified that. Because in Portland, I don't think he really did many hard drugs, but he mm, wrote, wrote some of his most memorable drug related songs in Portland, but he right. was not doing them. Right. <laughs> That's time, what, other yeah. than a lot of out yeah. maybe drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Which I learned anyway. later that they were about drugs. I, I, didn't, I didn't know what the white lady, like <laughs> when I first knew, you know, I mean, I was, my yeah. 20, I was still pretty young and didn't really know drug terms yeah. and even some of the alcohols he named in songs I was like 10 years later like oh okay I get it now like I just you know they were great songs without knowing all the all the references yeah. And, you know but yeah yeah that album is before he was doing a lot of that stuff, but just, yeah, like you said, using it as a metaphor and talking about, you know, experience maybe heard of or seen or whatever. But yeah. good clarification, yeah. Anything you want to talk about at the end, Charlie? No, I just, um, honestly, I just thank you for everybody who came uh, to, to check this out. I had a good time and uh, um, I think Casey knows my feelings about him from, from the last time uh, we were on Instagram, I, um, again, I'm truly thankful for for the things he did uh, for Elliot, um, for the fans, um, and and just the whole you know internet, even <laughs> just the internet too, you know, uh, kind of a trailblazer in my opinion uh, to to uh, weigh things are or can be and, uh, and definitely influenced me and um, so thank you Casey for taking the time to talk it's awesome to say hi directly to you and uh, even as even though it's you know through the internet which is funny <laughs> but uh, also uh, thank you to Jeff to for hosting um, for hosting this and uh, Again, thank you to all the fans for keeping Elliot's memory out there. And, uh, and you know, I see a lot of Joel Graves. I see Joel Graves um, um, here who, who uh, um, is one of the owners of uh, New Monkey. Um, thankful for, for, you know, him as well. You know, people who keep on uh, keeping Elliot's memory alive. And so thank you all for doing your part oh nicholas also <laughs> uh, we're making a heaven and heaven adores you and you know all those things so anyways thank you for swinging by and uh, thank you again jeff for hosting this yeah, thank you fun. thanks to you and casey and all the other things you just yeah. said i echo all of those things um is everybody you two anyways casey and charlie it got a little serious and heavy at times but if this goes on <laughs> youtube is is that okay? Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people couldn't be here that want to see it, so it's okay to post it up on YouTube. I'm. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. I, 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 it could have been heavier. I, I think. It's yeah, good. I didn't. I didn't talk. I was afraid I was gonna like babble all night and be embarrassed, but I was pretty quiet, so, I, so I'm pretty happy. So. <laughs> you did a great right. job. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, Jeff, guys. For putting it together. Thank yeah. you guys for attending, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you for all. And everything you did. Oh, thank, thank you. you guys. Thank you for all you did. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All Thanks right, to everybody. Oh. All right, guys. So, <laughs> see you guys. Bye. Joel's actually all right, guys. in the studio. I don't know if you guys saw that. Oh, if he wants to show it, he's in the studio right now. Yeah, I think he's in New Monkey right Put now. Put myself on gallery view. I was on the speaker view. There he is. Yeah, he's a new monkey. Yeah, he is it. There he is. All right. <laughs> awesome. Cool.
Well, uh, thank you guys. Yeah, you can, anybody can unmute yourself if anybody wants to stay. Okay. Anything. Anybody want to say anything? I think he just left. Ah. But... Uh. <laughs> Most people are. Anybody want to say anything? You can. Uh, just thank you guys for doing this. It's been wonderful, and well, I'm sure everyone really appreciates it. <laughs> well, thank you for being uh, here. Yes, thank you. See you around social media. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going I'm to end it. Bye. Hey, bye, right, guys. Sir, bye. bye. Have a good year. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Hopefully, I see you, Casey. <laughs>